my heart and all will hopefully fill the enormous gaps in my uh, knowledge. Uh, I don't want to take any of the precious minutes that uh, belong to the speakers, so let's launch into introducing them. Our uh, first speaker has a very special place in the heart of anyone who is engaged in Persian studies and, of course, at SOAS. I'm delighted uh, to introduce you to, if you needed any introduction, to Mrs. Fatima Sudova Farman Farmoyan. Fatima John is an absolute stalwart supporter of Persian studies, heading her uh, family's um, uh, uh, foundation and uh, an, an incredibly hands-on um, organizer of this amazing event that for years has been the jewel in the crown of the series of conferences and seminars and symposia we've had on Iran. Um, Fatima John will be um, moving us on to look at the prestige of the Persian culture when it comes to the, you know, vis a vis the Turco, um, the Khanates, if you like, and looking at this bicultural Turco Persian imperial entity. And the title of her talk is Fraying at the Edges Iran and the Khanates of Central Asia. And the case study is the uh, first Qaja ruler, Agha Muhammad Khan, whose ancestral base was Marv and um, was considered by him and by his clan an integral part of Iran. We will move further down the eastern borders of modern Iran and uh, very much welcome Dr. Sajjad Nejati. Uh, from Toronto. In fact, I don't know, are you actually in Toronto right now? Oh, right. So you've just had sort of breakfast or brunch. And um, Sajjo John will uh, uh, give us a talk entitled Proto-Nationalism in Early Modern Iran and Afghanistan. Well, obviously, shining the spotlight on the interconnected histories of Iran and Afghanistan, where it's often blurred by nationalist inspired discourses and um, uh, we'll also look at the you know the competing uh, forces on these uh, territories and um, uh, uh, with a, uh, a larger claim that the Afghan occupied lands of Khurasan which are now the uh, modern day Afghanistan were really part of the greater Iran. Uh, Sajjad is a senior lecture, uh, sessional lecturer at the University of Toronto, and I didn't want to take any minutes off you. I don't really need to in, in, um, introduce Fatima John to you, but Fatima John, born in Iran and an absolute citizen of the globe, she never stands still, a multilingual, a passionate uh, um, a scholar, independent scholar, and with a forensic analysis of from the arts to history, manuscript, geography, environment, and so on. Thirdly, I have a personal pleasure in being able to move away from Professor Perry's books on my bookshelves, which are longing for me to get back to my office at SOAS, to having him as our third panelist, um, in this final session. Uh, uh, professor John Perry, um, an emeritus professor from University of Chicago, and you really need about 10 minutes to just scroll down through the list of his publications, more than a dozen books, articles, and the numerous awards that has been bestowed upon him uh, on his work on the history of Persian language and so much more. Um, Professor uh, John Perry will look at Sir William Jones and the migration of the idea of Iran to India. So obviously, for all of you here, you know that the, since the 10th century, Northern India has been very closely associated with the influence of Persian culture and its literature and administration was ever increasingly Persianized. This began to wane under the Safavid rule and um, uh, then the talk will be encapsulated in looking at the Orientalist Sir William Jones and, um, and the judge, uh, obviously, and um, 
uh, his um, uh, influence on the uh, being a pioneer of, of um, uh, looking, you know, being the product, if you like, of this period where the axis shifts from both Persian India uh, versus Britain and modern West. So really looking at the first, I think Sir William Jones perhaps has the first claim to the title of uh, Orientalist. So Fatimijan, can I please invite you? I will ask you all to please stick to the 30 minutes with the exception of Mrs. Sudova. It is her gig. This is her party and she's Sahib Khane. You may have 35 minutes, Fatimijan. And uh, all the others, please mute your mics. And we are in your hands, Fatimijan. Please um, start your paper on fraying at the edges, Iran and the Khanates of Central Asia. And you might need to unmute yourself, Fatima John. Your mic is muted. Okay, is that it? Perfect. Uh, already seven minutes past five. No, yeah, but I'll yeah, now you hope for the best. I told after, you she's. Okay, after thanking the members of the team who organized this event under the most challenging circumstances, I would like to pay homage to the memory of Michael Axworthy. Some years ago, after his brilliant talk at the Iran Society on Adir Shah's army, I asked him whether Pana Ali Khan of the Caucasian Jabonshir tribe had been the herald and standard bearer of his troops at the end, as they entered Delhi. The information was relayed to me by one of Pana Khan's direct descendants, but I had no documented confirmation. It seems that he and his tribesmen were deported to Khorasan to prevent mischievous plots by Caucasian tribes loyal to the Safavids and once there were recruited for the Indian campaign. Upon his return from India, Pana Ali Khan hastened back home to appropriate Farabak, very much in the news, which remained under the suzerainty of his clan for three generations. He himself died while residing together with Agha Muhammad as honorary hostages at the court of Karim Khan Zan. His son and successor, Ibrahim Khalil Khan, was twice besieged by Agha Muhammad Khan in his waters of Shusha, renamed Pana Abad. The second successful siege occurred five days before the Shah's assassination and is often remembered for the poetic exchange inspired by verses from the 15th century poet Orfi, adapted to incorporate a pun on the words Shishe and Panah. Here were two leaders of Turkic clans negotiating war with Persian poetry. Ibrahim Khalil Khan sought Russian protection only to end up murdered a few late years later by those very same saviors. So the period preceding the Russian aggressions of the early 19th century was the gray zone of dual fealty that would end up in Russia's favor. It was a Russian rise to power that tilted directly to their side. Conversely, it was their encroachment on Transcaucasia that aroused the worst in Agha Muhammad Khan during his ruthless sack of Tiflis and eventually brought about the loss of Georgia. Axworthy was not surprised uh, about my question. He confirmed that at least two of Nadia's top military leaders, Eric Lee of Georgia and Ahmad Khan Abdullah of Afghanistan, had gone rogue, so to speak, and founded their own independent states after Nadia Shah's assassination. Eric Lee opted for Russian protection, whereas Ahmad Shah Abdullah was nominated by Pashtun Tribal Council as the first king of Afghanistan, where they adopted epithet Dor Dorani. Dor was commonly used for royalty. I have a seal of Abbas Mirza where it says Dor Dario So um, uh, he imposed, anyway, he imposed his hegemony over large swathes of Maratha territory in India and, and Iranian Khorasan, where other contenders were vying for control. After his death, it was back to tribal politics until the British intervened. Missing from the list of the multinational components of Nadir Shah's front line are Uzbek leaders, although many of their clansmen joined as mercenaries. The Shevonids and Uzbeks had pushed across the Sea of Dario and wrested control of Transoxiana and Khwarazm in the dying days of the Timurids. So these regions had in, fact, in effect been politically divorced from Iran since 1500 with no inclination to participate in the military adventures of the self-proclaimed heir to the self avid mantle. The Shevani there in Transoxiana was the culmination of mass migrations, the seeds of which had been sown as early as the third century when China expelled the Zhuangnu Hans, 
on their northern frontier and thereby unleash the first waves of the maelstrom westwards on the corridor of the Eurasian steppes where Turkey groups met, clashed and mixed with earlier Indo-European tribes were done likewise in an eastward direction as of the third millennium BC. Much of this is well known, but it helps to provide a sequential framework. So three million years later, we have Turkey horse later to be joined by Mongols on the move. A Turkic presence was already attested in the Sasanian present era when they joined forces with the Emperor Khosrow and Rushir Wanwan against the White Huns or Hephthalites. Much the same happened under the Salmanis when the still obscure Saljuk clan helped the Iranian dynasty against Karakhani rivals who were to found an Islamic Turkic state that stretched from Samarkand to Kashgar. Meanwhile, the Somalis were capturing Turkic nomads to train as elite guards of their court and sell as military slaves to the Abbasid Caliph at Baghdad. In time, these Turkic groups would rise against their masters and create their own powerful dynasties. The Ghaznavid slave guards of the Somalis were the first to pursue such ambitions, defeated in Khorasan. By the massive arrival of the Oghuz tribes in the 10th century, they were displaced eastwards and became the first Persian rulers of India with their capital at Lahore. Close on their heels came the 24 tribes of the Oghuz who raided and wrought havoc in northern Iran. There are actually 22 if you exclude the Khalaj. Until one of their clans, the Saljus, established a larger south than it likewise run by Persian administrators. According to Roma, the Oghuz brought with them the lightest of cultural births, so the Persian culture, quote, exercised upon them a peculiar attraction to which they readily responded, unquote. Their leaders converted to Islam and adopted Persian culture and institutions, but the illiterate rank and file of the Oghuz, little affected by the sophistication of their leaders, remained beholden to their troublesome ways and a serious nuisance to chiefs who have fought to reign over a sultanate consisting of the ancient civilizations of Western Asia. Upon the advice of the vizier Nizam Mulk, the sultans dispatched their unruly tribes into the frontiers of Rome as militant missionaries. The repercussions went beyond Islamization and determined the, uh, the future historical course of Western Asia and Eastern Europe for centuries to come. The presence of large numbers of Turkic tribes in northwestern Iran and Anatolia initiated the process of Turkization as it did in Transoxiana, where local Iranian languages like Khorasmian and Sofyan, while influencing Turkic speech, were paradoxically on their way to, exception, uh, to extinction, except in the Pamirs. The Turkicization of the spoken language, mainly in rural areas, did not dethrone new Persian from its high pedestal. After all, Bukhara was a major center of its gestation. It is ironic that while the rural population of Transoxiania were absorbing Turkic dialects, the cities of Khorasan were spawning the golden age of Persian poetry and prose that set the standard for literary creation thereafter. From the Turkic perspective, however, Mahmoud Koshkari, the author of the Divan al written in Arabic in Baghdad, was critical of the slurred speech of urban bilinguals and favored the pure, elegant Turkic of these kindred Karakhanis who ruled contemporaneously with the Saljo Sultanate, using the Turkic language and an Uyghur alphabet while venerating Afrosyab as their Turanian ancestor. The proliferation of nomadic groups in the northern steppes in the wake of the Mongolian conquest provided reinforcement for a Turko Islamic identity. A large contingent of Turks assembled on the flip chop stairs, followers of the Chinggis in a Turko Mongolian milieu that distanced them from the Persian and Gwot, though not from Islam. Even though the protect protracted stay on the northern steppes was not congenial to the Persianization of the Chorai, Taid, and Jushi descendants of Chinggis, as had been the case with the Ghaznafis and Saljus. Their speech was infused with Persian and after Islamization with Arabic too. As the majority of warriors in the Mongol armies were of Turkic rather than Mongol ethnicity, reconfigurations of tribal composition and identity were not infrequent. The Mongols themselves were few in number, but with unabated prestige remained supreme at the head of various tribal formations and political entities. Yet the Persian magnetic pull was strong enough to turn the Ilkhanid Mongols of Iran into patrons of a sophisticated Persianized culture that interacted more with China than with the Turco-Mongolian ambience of the Khepchak and the Golden Horde. 
that tendency would culminate with a spectacular one-man show staged by Timur and its brilliant encore in Herat. The development of a common Turkic idiom based on Karluk, later known as Choata, into a literary language modeled on Jomi, was achieved by Mirali Shirnavoi, the erudite vizier of Sultan Hossein Baybara, the last important and highly cultured Timurid prince of Herat upon the latter's behest. This would allow Chawatai to be used as an administrative and even literary tool without the need for a Persian transfer, a turning point in cultural relations between Iran and Transoxian. The Timurid Empire, which it bears to be repeated, was culturally Persian, having split between Samarkand and Herat after Timur's death was fragilized as a result. A branch of the Uzbek Shaywanids, the Arab Shois, took over Khorazm already in the late 15th century. With the history of trade with the northern steppes, the Kharazmians were among the first to Turkish size even before the appearance of the Mongols. So the adoption of Chawatai for their chancery was a natural outcome of linguistic change. Meanwhile, their kinsmen from another Chinkizid branch, descended from Jushi, offered support to the last Timurids of Samarkand under the leadership of Muhammad Shebani, also known as Shobach or Shebak. Um, he was uh, descended from uh, Jushi, as I said, was the eldest son of Chengiz. Contrary to Jushi and Chawatai, who resented Islam as inimical to the Mongolian Yasolos, Shibani Khan studiously prepared his conversion to Orthodox Sunnism, which he would defend assiduously. With the Safavid declaration of Shiism as a state religion, Persian came to become conflated with Shiite heresy and Chawatai with Sunni orthodoxy. Folk Shiite heterodoxy had been rampant in Iran before the Safavids and was congenial to nomads bred on shamanism. But the dogmatization of Shias and mainly through the agency of Lebanese religious scholars deepened the gulf with Shiite Iran. Bilingualism was not the problem. As recently mentioned by the poet Shafiq and Katkani, minority languages form the backbone of Iranian identity and an in depth understanding of the culture is stymied without them. Chokhatai Turkey could only become erosive to itself as a Persian by being decontextualized from the cultural baggage that initiated the speakers to trade administration and court culture. Turkic idioms were heavily imbued with Persian terminology and that goes for Ottoman Turkic too. Uh, so uh, the cultural link was not completely severed. Cities with a long history of Persian literacy, mainly Bukhara and Bakh, did not adhere to Chokhatai. They steadfastly that vastly clung to Persian within a Sunni mold. To this day, Bukhara remains Persian speaking, notwithstanding the presence of an Uzbek minority. Even Stalinist efforts to throw another wrench into their tragic identity were ineffective. Time and again on my trips, I've been surprised by the tenacity of these links. In 2003, a woman hearing that I was from Iran placed me at the center of a circle while she and her Tajik friends and a few bemused Uzbek women with their multiple braids and embroidered velvet caps circumambulated my person. It was an incredible experience, but it shows how deeply felt these links are. By 1500, Shaybani Khan was in control of the whole of Transoxiana with Timurid Herat and much of the rest of Khorasan to follow. When Shah Ismail I came to the defense of Khorasan, Shaybani Khan was killed during their confrontation at Marv in 1510. After the devastating onslaught of the Mongols on Marv, the whole oasis had become a no man's land, though still nominally part of Khorasan and Iran. It was prey to sporadic and short lived incursions by the Khans who raided Greater Khorasan repeatedly, but not Europe, during a part of the 16th century and well into the early 17th. Later attempts never lasted long. After a brief return of Babur to his ancestral lands, he was ousted by Shebani Khan's nephew, who established a petrative system of apanages that would extend to Balkh and Fergana. The apanages of Samarkand, Bukhara, Tashkent, and Balkh, inclusive of their provinces but with pockets of independence, were held by Chinggis and Khan's descendant from the four sons of Abu Khair Khan, the grandfather of Muhammad Shebani. Uh, the Khans were in turn backed by Uzbek military emirs who claimed descent from the eponymous Golden Horde leader of the 14th century who converted to Islam. It was an uneasy model that instigated rivalry between the signs of the family. 
The long rule of the powerful Abdullah Khan as Supreme Khan effectively eliminated their panaches. After his death, the succession passed to another line descended from Jushi, the Janits, also known as Togai Temuris, under whom Bath became the seat of the heir apparent and a second capital. The fracture of the crown into smaller entities once again exacerbated the internecine rivalries between pretenders of Chinggisid lineage and their military emirs without affecting their hostile attitude towards the Safavid state. Nor were the powerful Nashmandi Sufi orders whose influence had grown considerably inclined to depict the Shiite heretics. Sectarian massacres fed the rhetoric of propaganda, kindled strong emotions and were met with brutal retaliation by the opposing faction, but often, often served as an excuse for the ultimate aim of targeting Khorasan. In brief, since the separation of Herat from Bukhara under the later Timur, his Transoxiana had for all intents and purposes broken away from Iran, but the ambition to conquer or at least to raid large parts of Khorasan endured, alternating with periods of peaceful relations, mostly when trouble brewing at home impeded adventurism abroad. Whenever they penetrated deep into Iranian ter territory, it never lasted long. But the looting of the shrine of the Imam Reza in Mashhad offered rich rewards on more than one occasion. One successor of Muhammad Shaybun invaded the Khorasan five times and Herat at least twice in the 1530s, only to be repulsed by Shropet al Masban Khazid Bosch troops every time. Yet a certain in interdependence persisted. A renegade Khan threatened on the home front had little choice but to seek asylum at the court of Esfahan. The attacks resumed towards the end of the 16th century with another sacking of Mashhad and the slaughter of its inhabitants and more looting of the shrine. In the last years of Abdullah Khan, all of Khorasan, including Herat, was conquered by his Uzbek emirs who raided as far as Yat and Koshan. Um, this time staying on for a decade from 1588 to 1598. Attempts at driving them out remained inconclusive until the death of Abdullah Khan in 1598 when Shah Abbas reconquered Khorasan but failed to recapture Balkh in 1602. Hostilities resumed after Shah Abbas died. One Khan was, uh, was reputed to campaign in Khorasan more often than he went to the bath, but even he relented eventually to engage in peaceful relations. These campaigns were unsustainable over a longer period, and there seems to have been little compulsion to hold on to Khorasan permanently. Hostility was driven as much by sectarian differences and its attendant atrocities as by other seriously divisive problems, namely the abduction of thousands of Persians and Russians to sell in the slave markets of Bukhara and Khiva, justified on the grounds that infidels were fair game. The intermediaries were often unaffiliated Turkmen uh, tribes who moved between Khwarazm and Wadan Khurasan, selectively backing one Khan or another according to expediency. The Khans were happy to plunder while the Safavids were more intent on impeding intrusive marauders from breaching the frontiers of Khurasan, rather than to recuperate lost territory in Transoxiana at a time when they had to deal with more threatening Ottoman incursions on the Western Front. Internal rivalries would eventually weaken the Khanates. The 17th century was beset with crises. The Arab Shahis were on their way out. The Kharazm capital was moved from Urganj to Khiva due to water problems. The Khans of Khiva were raiding Bukhara. Hordes of nomadic Kazakhs were crossing the Sir Darya to the Zarab Shah Valley and joining Uzbek rebels to ravage Transoxiania to the point of famine and cannibalism. By the early 18th century, the Safavid and Mughal empires had become moribund while the Khanates were also in this raid. Nadir Shah was too engaged elsewhere to react to raids and abductions in the immediate. His attention was turned eastward toward India, so he dispatched his son Reza Holi to deal with the Khanates during his absence. By the time he returned, only Balkh had been recaptured, and within a few years it would be retrieved by Ahmad Shah Durrani and integrated into the new state of Afghanistan. Judging by his actions, Nadir Shah undertook his campaigns to Bukhara and Khiba with little intention of eliminating the Khanis. Rather, he sought to subjugate them by backing supportive clans in exchange for tribute in the form of grain, fodder, and horsemen. The Chinggisid and Uzbek elites, with all their infighting, were firmly ensconced, and even with Nadir's formidable battle hardened army, the reintegration of outlying breakaway provinces into a reconstituted Iranian empire would scarcely be envisaged. 
As the Khan of Bukhara and his Amirs were impressed by Nadir Shah's military exploits, they visited his camp to offer their submission. So there was no need to occupy Bukhara. But Khiba was besieged to obtain the liberation of the slaves who were liberated by the thousands. The ruler Ilbars Khan was executed for murdering the Jubar Sheikhs who had delivered Nadir's message and replaced him with a Janid Nadir. Uh, uh, Nadir Shah undoubtedly, sorry, entertained hopes that his proposition for the creation of a Vijayahari must have to unite Muslims might eventually result in a loose reunification. But these were vain, uh, vain hopes uh, that were insurmountable on both sides. At the time of Nadir's arrival in Bukhara, the power behind the Khan was the Atalik, a tutor from the Mangit Uzbek tribe similar to the Atabak in post al -Juhiran. The son of the first Atali, Muhammad Rahim, enjoyed the patronage of Nadir Shah to the point of commanding large numbers of Uzbek warriors to pacify Bukhara on his behalf. After Nadir Shah's death, the Mangis would betray his misplaced trust. The dynasty was actually founded by Muhammad Rahim's uncle, Daniel Bai, with a joint puppet in the background. The first time in over two centuries that a non chinggis had held the reins in Bukhara and stayed in power until 1920. But their hold on Khwarazm was short-lived. Having lost Khiba, the third Mangi, the fanatical Shah Murad proceeded to attack Mahar between 1785 and 1789-90. Northern Khorasan was the homeland of Northern Shah, and although sporadically raided, Mahar had never been integrated into Khanat or Anapanar. Shah Murad killed Bahram Ali Khan in Lugajar, also known as Azadon Lu and Bayram Ali in a Turkish-sized form. Um, the independent Lord of Marv, who was laid to rest in Masha. After destroying his citadel, he annexed Marv and deported the sedentary Iranian Shiite inhabitants, including the family of Bahram Ali Khan, to Bukhara and Samarkand, where they resettled separately from the local Persian speakers. Iran was unable to respond in the immediate, but the Qajars were not about to forgive or forget. Marv was not occupied for long due to mistrust and rivalry between the sons of Shah Murad. Turkmen tribes moved in to occupy back. So here we go in answer to one of the questions with more about the Turkmen, a tricky designation that can have as many meanings as there are Turkmen clans. The most widely accepted definition is that of early Islamic sources such as Biruni, that the Oghuz who converted to Islam were thereafter designated as Turkmen. The Oghuz first penetrated the periphery of Transoxiana in the 8th century, at about the same time that Arab proselytes also reached the region. The oasis of northern Khorasan provided the base of these pastoralist groups, not all of whom moved out in the 11th century to raid Azerbaijan, Transcaucasia, and Eastern Anatolia. The largest concentration of Turkmen was in Khorasan, where at the end of Arab Shoei rule around 1700, they amounted to a quarter of the population while large numbers also moved into northern Khorasan after the fall of the Sultans. With no fixed allegiance, they shifted between one or another party. As the main intermediaries of the state trade, they came under frequent attack from the Iranian side, but occasionally served he was unofficial and undependent, un undependable, sorry, military auxiliaries. The clash of Yomut Turkmen with Uzbeks in 1770 resulted in the capture of Khiva from the Uzbek home Grad, followed by anarchy and the expulsion of the Yomut who then converged on Mar. But this was after Mazar Over the centuries, the composition of Turkmen types reconfigured as a result of widespread movements, contacts with other tribes, and fluctuating political and economic ties. Having absorbed Tajiks, Persians, Kurds, and various tribes from the steppe, not all the Turkmen were Oghuz, nor were they even Turks. Those who sedentarized or joined confederations came to be known more often by their tribal or political affiliations rather than as Turkmen. The Qajars are a case in point. As followers of Sheikh Haidar of the Safavid order, they were among the earliest groups to join the Ghazal Bash and were thereafter known by the name of their tribe and its subdivisions rather than as Turkmen. In the Safavid period, they held the governorships of Ganjo, Erevan, and Karabakh and became a force to reckon with. When Shah Abbas dispatched Kurdish and Turkmen tribes to defend the northeastern marches against Turkmen and Uzbek tribes, Qajar contingents are said to have been transferred to Astarabad and Mar. 
The mobility of Turkmen groups makes it difficult to pinpoint their precise locations at any given time. But the Khajar presence at those locations may go back earlier. Persian historians often refer to Marv as the homeland of the Khajars. And their origin is variously traced to the Oghuz migrations or the, to the tribes who joined Holoku Khan's campaigns in Iran. By the Safavid era, if not earlier, the Khoyunlu clan, or Khobanlu clan, as they were also called, which would reign over Iran, held the port of Akhali at Astarabad. By the way, Astarabad is Gorgon, it's not Wazandaran, as one or two people have said. And that's where Akha Muhammad was born. Although Marv was devastated and depopulated cruelly by the Mongols, its ancient history awarded the special place in Iranian memory. It was one of the 16 perfect lands named in the Avesta and an important Achaemenid satrapy. It was where the Silk Road was launched officially when a delegation from Han emperors from China was met there ceremoniously by Parthian cavalrymen. It was where the last Sasanian emperor Yastigevsky was men murdered on his flight from the Arab armies. It was a hub of religious interaction between the Russian Buddhist mannequins, Christians who had the large bishopric there, by the way, and it was from there that Abu Muslim Khorasani launched the Abbasid revolution, following which it became the capital of the Eastern Caliphate of Mum. And finally, in its heyday, it was a seat of learning with libraries that had practiced some of the greatest early Islamic polymaths. It had its last great days under the Saljos, as is evident from the famous tomb of Sultan Sanjar, which has sadly been disfigured by misguided restoration, uh, entrusted to Turkish experts who adorned it with uncharacteristic trilobate Arab and Andalusian arches beneath the drum. Robert Hillenband spoke about it some years ago at the IHS Heritage Talk. I think there's a podcast you can listen to. After the Mongol onslaught destroyed the city and the Sultan banned the famous dam on the Morghab River that nourished the oasis, Turkmen tribes and their flocks continued to roam in the area. The only major monument erected after the Mongol ravages was a citadel of the Ezzedin Lur as a Don Lukacars built by Bahram Ali Khan or Bahram Ali Khan or one of his predecessors, who, uh, Mehrab Khan Karabaki, who had also been a governor of Mer. The Zedinlu dominated the oasis until 1785, entertaining variable relations with Turkmen tribes who in that area were mostly Salur, Sarur, Zanteke, and later Yomuts. Um, so Kevin mentioned that giving refuge to Muhammad Hassan Khan uh, in the Karakum Desert, so I won't repeat that. The Salurs were considered the most noble tribe among the Turkmen, and they enjoyed a certain paramountcy to quote Golden among the original Oghuz. They traded in skins and horses rather than in slaves. Their daughters were sought as brides by the Khajar chief. Baron Ali Khan's mother was a Salur, as was the mother of Fat Ali Shah, was born of an Ezzedin Lu Khajar union, indicating the reverence these tribal elders enjoyed among their kinsmen, as confirmed orally by all the members of the Khajar clan. After his coronation, Aqa Muhammad Khan sought to recover lost province. He wrote to Zaman Shah of Kabul to reclaim the possession of Barak. The polite refusal arrived of Tete. And he contemplated the recapture of Bukhara and Mar. On his barefoot and tearful pilgrimage to the shrine of Imam Reza, where he stopped to grieve on the grave of Aqa Bahram Boli, as he called him, uh, he heard the latter's voice imploring him to avenge his blood now that the kingship was there and to take punitive action for the cruel fate inflicted on the people of Mar. Had he lived, Ahmad Khan would have undoubtedly reacted as ruthlessly to the occupation of Mar as he did to that of his pupils. Shah Murad had sent his son Amir Zadir Nasiruddin to, to govern Mar, but upon his death and the accession of his other son Amir Haydar, the Amir Zadir was recalled to Bukhara. Suspicious of his brother's intention, he disobeyed and stayed on in rebellion. Uh, until his plans ran out. He was considering sanctuary in Afghanistan, but the new Qajar governor of Khorasan, Prince Muhammad Bali Mirza, fearing an Uzbek-Afghan alliance and striving to restore the frontiers of Khorasan, invited him to stay in Mashhad as his personal guest. The next governor, Prince Shoja Sartani, unwisely suspended his alliance, so the Amir said he was thinking of appealing to Russians or in English protectors when he met James Bailey Fraser in Mashhad. Through Fraser's conversations with the Amir Zadeh, we learned that the son of Bahram Ali Khan, Muhammad Hussein Khan Mardi or Mardazi, who resided as an honorable captive at the court of Bukhara, was plotting revenge. 
He contacted the Amirzadeh to help him recover Bukhara from Amir Haida. When news of the conspiracy leaked out, they both had to flee to Mashhad, where the Khan Marvi, as he was known, proceeded to the encampment of Agha Muhammad Khan. There he was asked to deliver a message to Shah Murad demanding capitulation, but he seems to have ended up at the court of Bakari Shah in Tehran. Any attempt by Bukhara or Khiba to fill the void was short-lived in the face of the looming Russian threat. We have no report on the ultimate fate of the Amir Zadeh, but the issue of Mahab continued to play relations with Bukhara. And there are at least three later episodes worth mentioning, one of which will again answer our previous question. The first was unveiled when the anonymous Safar Rami Bukhara was published in Tehran in 1995 and reviewed in English by James Gustafson in 2013 in Iranian studies. It has since been identified as the travel memoirs of Abbas Holi Khan, an envoy sent by Muhammad Shah in 1844, upon the request of British Chargé Justin Shiel, who in the wake of the murder of British agents Colonel Stoddart and Captain Connolly in Bukhara, was concerned that the same fate might befall Joseph Wolf, a Christian convert and missionary who traveled there to inquire about their fate. Abbas Holi Khan spent four days in Mar before meeting the Amir of Bukhara to present his case, namely that Mar was the homeland of the Hajars. Invoking the historical and cultural unity of Iran and Greater Khorasan with Transoxiana, he retraced Iran's hereditary right to Mar to the reign of the first epic king Manucher, the grandson of Ereidun in the Shonam. With the latter began the conflict between Iran and Tehran, of course, represented by Afrosyab, which was resolved by the era of the Arch of Arash landing on the Oxus at Bath to demarcate the frontier between Iran and Tehran. Reference to epic heroes present as Gustafsson maintains a conceptual geography of Central Asia that supports their difference as well as unity in a Persian cultural sphere. It is this emotionally charged devotion to historical or mythological memory that turned Nadir Shwan of Khan into fierce upholders of a common identity that was alien to the Amir's blinkered view and denial of unifying faith. And by the way, Abbas Holi Khan saved the world and took him back to Tehran. A more pragmatic discourse was held by Sultan Murad Mirza Hassan Salkane, who led the final unsuccessful campaign during the Herat War of 1856-57. The gist of his lengthy argument, as reported by British Sharjah that their East Week and his memoirs, was that apart from being the homeland of a large part of the Qajar tribe, and as rightfully belonging to Persia as any of the Shah's dominions, quote unquote, the stronghold of Mar was strategically vital because the frontiers of Persia, quote, being coterminous with the country of the Turkmans, unquote, are too long to prevent inroads and kidnappings, except through the possession of Mar, which is best reached through Herat, and the forts en route that can signal raids. The final attempt was the Mar campaign led by Prince Hamza Mirza Heshmat in 1860, when his army was soundly defeated by Turkmen tribes. Arthur de Gobineau wrote a satirical story about this in Le Nouvelle Gazette called L'Histoire de Gambehali. It wittily exposes the corruption and ineptitude of the army responsible for that military disaster. Less than a quarter of a century later, the Russian standard of Mar, the great game was in full swing. The negative or positive effects of that transformational moment are beyond the scope of this talk, but there is no doubt about the distortion of the long-term memory of a shared culture distinguished by its similarity as much as by its differences as opposed to an approach that serves short-term policies rather than historical truths and misrepresents and impoverishes the enriching gift of cultural awareness. Examples of region, but I have no time for that. Thank you, now guess for giving me. No, it's so wonderful. Well, you were spot on. You're just, you I... are just 32 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Sudova. Uh, Dr. Sajjad Nejati, may I invite you now to uh, talk on uh, proto-nationalism in early modern Iran and Afghanistan. And to our lovely audience, do uh, put your questions in the chat, which we will answer after all speakers have completed their papers. Uh, over to you, Sergeant John. Um, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Absolutely Nadia. can. And uh, if I may just uh, have access to uh, sharing the screen, please. There we go. 
Um, before starting uh, my uh, lecture, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, thank um, all the organizers involved in um, having this uh, event take place. Um, the Sudovar uh, organization, uh, the Center of Iranian Studies at SOAS, uh, also the organizing committee. I can only imagine how difficult it must be to organize a symposium of this breadth and scope, and it must be uh, doubly difficult to do so in the context of a global uh, pandemic. So um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to all the organizers. Um, one of uh, the main themes of uh, this year's symposium uh, is the transition of Iran to a new world order. Um, or uh, the way I like to see it is the gradual shift of Iran from early modernity to modernity. Uh, with this theme in mind, uh, the present lecture was developed with the aim of outlining uh, the early development of nationalism one of the defining features of modernity in Iran, as well as its Eastern neighbor, Afghanistan, with which Iran shares a lengthy history. For the purposes of this lecture, I've defined nationalism uh, very broadly as an ideology of common origin, ethnicity, and or cultural ties, as well as how such an ideology manifests itself within the demarcated territorial boundaries of a nation state. Now, despite the criticism of nationalism in the age of globalization, wherein increased activities across national boundaries uh, renders borders increasingly redundant, nationalist sentiments remain important features of society in Iran and Afghanistan to the present. And this is to mention nothing of the Iranian and Afghan communities living in the diaspora, but many of whom have a strong sense of affiliation or belonging to their homeland or the Watan or the Vatan. The present reality of Iran and Afghanistan as distinct nations belies a long history of interconnectedness in terms of culture, economy, and politics. There are myriad examples uh, that one could draw upon to illustrate this interconnectedness. In the cultural sphere, Iran and Afghanistan uh, represent core lands of the so-called Persianate zone. That is that vast territorial expanse that is defined historically by Persian culture. For a germane example, we need look no further than the Shahnameh, a masterpiece of Persian literature that was composed by Abul Qasim Firdausi in the 10th century, and which is often described as the national epic of Iran. Yet it will be recalled that the Shahnameh was presented to the Ghaznavid ruler, Sultan Mahmud, whose court was based in Ghazna of what is today Southeastern Afghanistan. With respect to political history, uh, numerous dynasties competed for control over territories encompassing parts of what is today Iran and Afghanistan historically. And we can trace some of these uh, competitions uh, back to the pre-Islamic period, uh, through to the early Islamic period, and as late as the Safavid period, and as I will discuss in this uh, lecture, beyond the Safavid period. This interconnected history between Iran and Afghanistan um, raises the important question, what factors can be attributed to the firm divide between the two countries? Now, many scholars point to the rise of European nationalism as the main culprit. According to such narratives, nation states first develop in early modern Europe. Then through the influence of European colonial powers, the idea of the nation state is imported to non, the non-Western world in the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. But while there is no denying that colonial powers, especially Imperial Russia and Britain, played a formative role in the development of the nations and nationalisms of Iran and Afghanistan. We would not, uh, I, or, or we should not, I argue, uh, discount some of the local roots of nationalist sentiments or what I have termed uh, proto-nationalist, uh, proto-nationalism. Um, these proto-nationalist sentiments uh, predate the arrival of these European powers in the region and uh, would, uh, as I shall argue, 
influence uh, the course that uh, nationalist discourses would take uh, in the modern period. Now, by proto-nationalism, I simply refer to those sentiments that would form, again, the core aspects of the national dis nationalist discourses of Iran and Afghanistan in the modern era. Now, the development of these proto-nationalist sentiments can be traced back to the late Safavid era. In particular, the reign of Shah Abbas, which is seen as the apex or the zenith of Safavid rule. Uh, according to the Safavid uh, historiography, the death of Shah Abbas marks the beginning of the slow decline of the Safavid empire. And the Eastern provinces uh, slowly be begin to break away in a process that Fatima John has described as the fraying at the edges. Here we have a map, and I hope everybody can see the map of uh, the situation on the peripheries of Iran in the late Safavid period with all of these tribal pressures um, existing on uh, the borderlands. Now, my focus is on the region of Khorasan in the east, where the challenges to Safavid authority came mainly from Afghan or Pashtun uh, tribal groups seeking autonomy. Uh, in the early 1700s, the Khalze Afghans uh, were able to take over what had hitherto been uh, the Safavid province of Kandahar. And within a short decade, the Abdali Afghans would move on to Herat and assume control over that also hitherto Safavid province. The importance of these Safavid, uh, anti-Safavid insurrections led by the Afghans cannot be underestimated. The period of Qalze rule in Kandahar set in motion a process of independent Afghan statehood, a major component of which was Kandahar becoming the imperial capital of the Durrani state, which was established in 1747 by the Abdalis, who thereafter became known as the Duranis. I'm sorry, let me just uh, enter full screen for this presentation. <clears throat> now, the rise to uh, prominence of the post Safavid monarch Nadir Shah Afshari temporarily halted the Afghan, tribe, uh, Afghan drive towards statehood. Seeking to reconstitute the domains of the Safavid Empire, Nadir assumed control of Herat in 1730, ending roughly two decades of Abdali rule in the province. With the possible exception of his campaigns in the Caucasus, the battle for Herat served as the most arduous of Nader's numerous uh, incursions in Khorasan. Unlike many of his other conquests, Nader was unsuccessful in capturing Herat by sheer force. But his uh, instead, his victory was achieved through mediation with uh, its Abdali defenders. In part to placate his Abdali adversaries, Nader was compelled to appoint an Abdali chief as the governor of Herat and enlisted many Abdali tribesmen into the Naderid army. The Abdalis would go on to play a central role in the subsequent campaigns of Nader Shah, including the conquest of Kandahar in 1738 against the Khalze Afghans. The Abdalis, it would not be an overstatement to say, were instrumental to creating what Ernest Tucker has described as the Timurid inspired world empire that Nader Shah had established, and that at its height extended from Iraq in the west to India in the east. And here we have a map of the vast territorial expanse of the Nadirid empire. Now, in the power vacuum that was created uh, by Nader's um, assassination in 1747, there were various local powers that emerged uh, to contend for the throne. In Khurasan, there arose two main contenders, uh, the Qajars under their chief, Agha Muhammad Khan, and the Abdalis under their chief, Ahmad Khan, the soon-to-be Ahmad Shah Durrani. This Qajar Durrani uh, rivalry um, sparked what had become, what was to become 
a decades long political duel for the fate of Khorasan that became entwined with the so-called great game between Imperial Russia and Britain. The end result of this uh, great game was the demarcation of uh, rather firm boundaries between modern Iran and Afghanistan. Now, the foregoing uh, summary uh, reinforces my initial uh, assertion that the history of the lands comprising present-day Afghanistan and Iran are closely linked. And uh, accounting for this deeply interconnected history allows us to reassess various assumptions, oversimplifications, misconceptions, and contradictions concerning nationalism in Iran and Afghanistan that still predominate in the scholarship today. One of the problems that I wanted to address in this lecture was the view of the Afghan state as a creation of colonial Britain, which feeds into uh, an alternate or a similar narrative, I should say, that was endorsed fully by the Qajars, that the Dur Durrani lands of Khurasan were traditionally Iranian territories that were incorporated into the Afghan state, primarily through the machinations of colonial Britain. In his uh, work, The Making of Modern Afghanistan, uh, Benjamin D. Hopkins persuasively argues that present-day Afghanistan was conceptually and materially a creation of the British colonial regime of India in the 19th century. But what is interesting is that the view of Afghanistan as a colonial creation was seemingly equally widespread, uh, uh, existed seemingly uh, with the seemingly equally widespread yet conflicting narrative that Afghanistan was established by Ahmad Shah Durrani, who is seen by Afghans as the founding father of their nation, the Baba of the country, but whose reign predated British activities in the region by several decades. This raises the question, is modern Afghanistan a colonial creation or one of Ahmad Shah? There's no scholarly consensus, but the truth seems to lie somewhere in between. With respect to territoriality, one of the key features of modern nation states, the view that Ahmed Shah founded Afghanistan is tenuous at best. As several scholars have noted, uh, primary sources do not refer to the Durrani territories as Afghanistan, but instead use territorial markers such as Khorasan or Hindustan and the like. It is true that the core lands of Ahmed Shah's empire here we have an image of Ahmed Shah. And here we have a map of the empire. Uh, the core lands of the Durrani state, namely Kabul, Kandahar, Herat, and Balkh, would form the heartland of what was to become Afghanistan. And in this respect, the Durrani empire may be considered a precursor to present-day Afghanistan. However, it should be emphasized that any notion of a territorially bounded nation would have been alien to Ahmed Shah who followed uh, the example of his predecessor, Nader Shah, in seeking to create a Timurid-style world empire. The borders of this empire were not fixed, but expanded well into Iran and India. There is also indication that had Ahmed Shah survived a little bit longer, he would have also actively engaged in Central Asia, which at the time was being threatened by the Qing Empire in the Northeast. In this regard, Ahmed Shah's worldview was more globalist in orientation than nationalist. At the societal level, moreover, Ahmed Shah nurtured a form of Islamic cosmopolitanism that was not uncommon to pre-modern Muslim societies across Asia. Now, I would argue that Ahmed Shah's most significant contribution to the nationalist discourse in Afghanistan was not territorial in nature, Rather, it was the genealogical claims that he asserted in support of his claims to rule. Despite patronizing Persian culture and cultivating a Persian language administration, Ahmed Shah placed strong emphasis on the Pashtun or Afghan identity of the ruling elite of the Afghan state. Indeed, in various primary sources from Ahmed Shah's reign, uh, be it Mahmoud al husseinis Tariq Ahmed Shahi, which was the court commission chronicle of the early Durrani period. Or whether it be other official documents such as the well-known correspondence between the Shah and the Ottoman ruler, Sultan Mustafa III, 
Ahmad Shah asserts his legitimacy by claiming that his ancestors historically had served as leaders, not just of the Durrani Confederacy to which he belonged, but of all Afghan Pashtun tribes. I argue that the emphasis uh, on the Afghan Pashtun identity of the Durrani state under Ahmed Shah would ultimately become a pillar of nationalism as it developed under his successors. A prominent example may be detected in the works of the Afghan statesman, uh, statesman Mahmoud Tarzi, who's regarded as the ideologue of modern na uh, Afghan nationalism. In the writings of Tarzi, who incidentally belonged to the Durrani tribe like Ahmed Shah himself, the Afghan Pashtun identity of Afghanistan is tactfully utilized as one of the core features that differentiate the country from Iran. In this respect, ideas of Afghan identity disseminated by the ruling elites of the Durrani state since the time of Ahmed Shah arguably played a more important and significant role than the activities of colonial Britain in the creation of a distinct Afghan polity. Now, returning to the role of the British in the Durrani Qajar dispute over Khurasan, uh, the second main point I wanted to cover in this lecture. Uh, the main controversy uh, surrounding this dispute was the province of Herat which uh, was a bone of contention between the Duranis and the Qajars. The view espoused by Iranian authors in the late 18th and early 19th century, uh, including Riza Quli Khan Hidayat, my apologies. Uh, Riza Quli Khan Hidayat and Muhammad Taqi Khan Lisan al-Mulk is that Hiran, uh, Hirat, I should say, was the realm of Iranian kings. And here the reference is clearly to the Safavids. Uh, the first of the Qajar dynasts, Agha Muhammad Khan and his successor, Fat Ali Shah, considered themselves as legitimate heirs of the Safavids and sought to reconstitute the Safavid empire. And this included the Afghan occupied territories of Khurasan. In the year 1797, the Qajars in fact sent an emissary to the court of one of Ahmed Shah's successors, uh, Zaman Shah, demanding the withdrawal of Afghan forces from what the Qajars viewed as Iranian territory in Khurasan, including Herat, but also Kandahar, Balkh, and many of the regions in between. Now, this uh, was the first attempt in a decades long Qajar effort to reestablish control over Herat. Um, these ambitions eventually culminated in the Anglo-Iranian War of 1856-57. Uh, the defeat of the Qajar forces in this battle led to the Treaty of Paris. And the terms of this treaty required the Qajars to permanently withdraw all claims to uh, authority over Herat. As Abbas Amonat has pointed out in several of his pub, uh, publications, in the national consciousness of Iran, the Treaty of Paris was a catastrophe, second only to the Treaty of Turkmenchai with the Russians, which of course resulted in the permanent ceding of control of the Caucasus. From the Iranian perspective, the Treaty of Paris was yet another instance of the Qajars being forced by an imperial power to seek control of traditionally Iranian territory. Now, the view of Herat as a rightful domain of the Qajars and as heirs to the Safavids is quite controversial, given that the province had long been contested by various polities throughout its history. Prior to the Safavid takeover of Herat in the early 16th century, uh, the province had served as the capital of the Timurid prince, Sultan Hussein Baikara. And throughout the early 16th century and the post-Timurid period, the Safavids and Uzbeks dueled for control over Herat on several occasions. Ultimately, the Safavids were able to wrest control of the province from the Uzbeks, and the province remained in Safavid control throughout the 17th century. But Herat was administered by various different regimes throughout the 18th century, including that of the Abdalis uh, of Nadir Shah, and after Nadir Shah, uh, the Duranis. 
Taken in its historical context then, the durrani qajar rivalry appears to be a more recent manifestation of a long series of disputes over the sovereignty of Herat that spans over many centuries. Now, to counter some of the claims made by the Qajars to rightful authority over Herat, um, the Duranis themselves also devised various strategies to assert Herat as an Afghan territory. In early Durrani era sources, beginning with the reign of Ahmad Shah, uh, for instance, uh, they strongly emphasize the brief period of Afghan rule in Herat after the fall of the Safavids in the province in the 1710s. Uh, this period of rule lasted until 1730 when the province was, as mentioned earlier, invaded by Nader Shah. But soon after Nader Shah's reign, the Durrani forces recaptured Herat and it remained under Afghan control ever since. Ahmad Shah and his successors derived their leg legitimacy from their status as the descendants of the Abdali chiefs, the Khanzadas, who had established rule in post-Safavid Herat. And as such, these uh, claims were uh, intended to demonstrate that the Duranis were, it was only natural that the Duranis would have exercised rule over the province in the aftermath of Nader Shah's assassination. There was also an important sectarian dimension to the Afghan claims over Herat and its surrounding regions. Primary sources from the early Durrani period seek to credit this uh, Safavid era as a sort of historical anomaly. Um, according to this view, the Safavids converted what had hitherto been a Sunni uh, country in Iran to Shiism. Uh, they credit Nader Shah for recognizing Iran's Sunni history and distancing himself from Safavid Shiism. But as a merciless tyrant, Nader's rule was destined to fail. In the end, Nader's reign was merely a short, brief interlude between extended periods of just Afghan rule. Now, under Ahmad Shah's successors, the ideological battle for um, the hearts and minds of the people of Herat, uh, it continued unabated. In response to the Qajar uh, mission to the Durrani court demanding the withdrawal of Afghan forces, it is no coincidence that um, Ahmad Shah's grandson, who was ruling at the time, uh, his grandson, Zaman Shah, uh, commissioned a member of the Chishti Sufi order to compose a history of the Durrani dynasty. In this work known as the Hussein Shahi, the Abdali Afghans are said to have taken their name from the 10th century Sufi master, Abu Ahmad Abdol, who is the patron saint of the shrine town of Chisht just east of Herat. You know, I'll just go back to the map of uh, the Durrani Empire and here we see Chisht, um, this important town just to the east of Herat. Now the reality is that there's no reliable historical evidence to support this Abdali Chishti relationship. Yet it has since become a stock feature of studies about the Abdali and their state. I would argue that this claim was an invented tradition specifically designed to assert the presence of the, of the Abdali Afghans in Herat dating back to the 10th century and to thereby trump any historical claims put forward by the Qajars and their supporters to rightful authority over Herat. In essence, the Afghan presence predates that of the Qajars in the region and therefore they're the legitimate uh, claimants to authority over the region. Now, what we see here is that the claims made by the Qajars uh, and as documented in uh, the Qajar historiography were met by many counterclaims that were devised at uh, the Durrani court, but which are typically overlooked in the scholarship. These are important because they point to the development of a lively robust debate surrounding Khurasan and its, uh, and its fate that continued throughout the first half of the 19th century and that culminated in the Treaty of Paris. The idea that uh, the idea here is not to diminish the role of Britain or Russia, uh, who obviously exploited uh, the Durrani uh, Qajar dispute and worked to create a firm national boundary 
dividing uh, the Iranian and Afghan states to protect their interests in Afghanistan and by extension, their possessions in India. But what is crucial to note here is that the seeds of nationalism sown by the Qajars and the Durrani's in their duel for the fate of Khorasan played an equally significant part in the formation of modern Iran and Afghanistan as distinct nations. And I'm not sure at what point I am in uh, the timeline, but uh, I will end um, my lecture at this point uh, to give an opportunity to the other panelists to speak and also for the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sajjan. In fact, you do have a couple of more minutes if you'd like to, or would you like to pause and perhaps follow through with the, in the discussion at the end, or is there any other points that you're very keen to um, emphasize? Well, there's, yeah, there's okay. a lot of points. I, I would think that uh, they might get a little bit too detailed. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I wanted well, to give you a little bit more detail okay. about the nature of the dispute in the 19th century, but it's like my... very good. Yes, yeah. well, keep keep us hungry. Keep us. We'll be uh, <laughs> waiting for that. And um, it now gives me great pleasure to invite our final speaker of the day and this session, Professor John Perry, who um, will. Um, I, I can't wait personally. I'll be all ears, Professor Perry, to learn. Uh, your thoughts on uh, Sir William Jones, the jurist, uh, and how he will feature in this talk. Um, and uh, you're so well positioned as a historian, linguist, uh, philologist yourself. So can I please invite you uh, to talk about Sir William Jones and the migration of the idea of Iran to India? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay. Well, it's an honor to be the final speaker at this uh, symposium. So let me begin just by thanking all the organizers and my fellow participants in this um, outstanding symposium, uh, very well conceived and in view of the circumstances, extremely well organized. Uh, <clears throat> so we have Sir William Jones and the migration of Iran to, uh, sorry, yes, the idea of Iran, the migration of the idea of Iran to India, which I prefer to think of in modern terms sometimes as the outsourcing of Iran to uh, India, the uh, um, land of Iran having somewhat failed in its support in the, those days. India had long been familiar to Iran and the West as the land of fabulous wealth, wonders and wisdom from early Sasanid times. The Sanskrit collection of animal fables known as the Panchatantra was translated into Middle Persian, then by Ibn al makafa into Arabic as Kalila wa Dimna, and rapidly acquired versions in Greek, Latin, and Old Spanish, Hebrew, English, and indeed most, Euro most medieval European languages, to become an early self-motivational bestseller a rival to Aesop's fables or the Disciplina Clericalis. The actual Persianization of North India, North Indian literary and administrative culture began with Sultan Mahmud of Ghazna's conquest of Lahore and Punjab province in the early 11th century. His destructive incursions targeting the fabled wealth of Hindu temples had a positive side the philosopher and pioneering Indologist Abu Rehan al-Biruni, embedded with the army, learned Sanskrit and consulted Hindu pundits, publishing two volumes in Arabic of his impressions of Indian science and theology. Subsequent dynasties of Turkish military Mamluks consolidated the Muslim mastery of the Punjab and poets such as Mas'ud Isadi Salmani, who died in 1121, 
and Amir Khosrow Dehlavi died 1325, uh, who gloried in being of mixed Turco-Persian and Indian birth, secured Persians' domination, Persians' position as the language of Indian courts. In 1526 to 25 to 26, Babur, the late Timurid prince of Fergana, descended from Chinggis Khan on his mother's side and Tamerlane on his father's, a former client of Ismail Safavi and an accomplished poet and memoirist in Chagatai Turkish and Persian, conquered Delhi and Agra, founding the Mughal Empire. This venerable institution was to remain the principal patron of Indo-Persian literature for more than three centuries, even when politically subordinate to more powerful uh, regional conquerors, such as Nader Shah in 1732, and the English East India Company from 17, 1766, when General Robert Clive persuaded Shah Alam to uh, cede the Diwani, that is the monopoly of revenue collection in Bengal, and thus the de facto government of India. Hot on the heels of poets, as ever, came lexicographers. India, in, initially more native to, Iran, to India than immigrant, and from the early uh, 14th to the late 19th century, Dozens more Persian dictionaries were produced in India than in Iran. One example is the uh, popular Farhang Jahangiri of Hossein Enju from Shiraz, completed in 1602 at Akbar's court. This was used also by Europeans even beyond India. Thomas Hyde, Laudian professor of Arabic at Oxford, cited it in his Latin monograph on the religions of the ancient Persians in 1700. Then in 1722 came the Afghan invasion of a dying Safavid empire. Among the first and most directly affected by the fall of Isfahan and who has left us the most complete picture of the catastrophe and its aftermath in his memoirs, completed in 1742, was the Shi'i poet and scholar Sheikh Hazin Lahiji of Gilan. As a boy, he grew up with his father at the Safavid court as a precocious polymath and poet. In 1721, as the Afghan army closed in to blockade the starving capital, he tried in vain to persuade Shah Sultan Hussein and his own family to flee before it was too late. Then, leaving behind his precious library, he slipped away disguised as a peasant. And after two years teaching among the Lur in Khoramabad, uh, he uh, organizing there a militia to defend the town against the uh, advancing Ottoman army and a dispiriting, a dispiriting visit to his homeland, occup, uh, Russian-occupied Gilan in 1730-34. Horrified by the continued oppression under Nader Shah, he left Iran and settled in the Mughal court of Delhi. Here, five years later, he went into hiding to avoid a massacre when Nader Shah invaded the city. He moved on to Agra and then Benares, modern Varanasi, where he died and was buried in 1766. In his exile, Hazin was treated as a celebrity. Open-minded, he sought out fellow scholars of all faiths. According to Sir Gore Ousley, a British Orientalist of the next generation, a colleague of Jones, Hazin was equally admired and esteemed by the Muslim, Hindu, and English inhabitants of India. In the half century between the final calamitous collapse of respectively the Safavid and the Zan dynasties, uh, say 1730s to 1780s, 
some hundreds of, of literate and variously prominent Iranians, not only Safavid survivors, often with their families, fled to India. Several, like uh, Abul Hassan Gulistani, became rueful chroniclers of this period. His three uncles served Nada, but then fell into two fell into disfavor uh, um, <clears throat> and fled to India. Abu Hassan was a hostage in Karim Khan's retinue during the contest for power in central or western in Iran. But in 1756, slipped away to the Shi shrine city of Najaf and joined his family in India. Here, at Murshidabad in 1782, he wrote his uh, Mujmil at Tabarikh, a detailed history of the early Zand period. Of those who stayed in Iran, the poet and literary biographer Azar Big Delhi famously lamented that the situation had reached such a point when no one had the, the heart to read poetry, let alone write it. In India, meanwhile, composition and recital of Persian verse, especially the Ghazal, were all the rage, and not only at the ruler's courts. By this time, French, Armenian, and subsequently British traders and commercial agents were settled in several cities. In the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, more than 60 of these resident Ferengis or their mixed offspring, including eight women, had sufficient command of Persian and later Urdu to dabble in the mild intoxicant of Ghazal or Rubai. Uh, basking in the applause of indulgent Indians to compose poems at the convivial Musha'iri verse readings. Some even accumulated considerable divans. Into this fluid social and cultural environment in 1783 stepped Sir William Jones, newly knighted and married to Anna Maria Shipley as a judge on the Bengal bench. Born in London in 1746, his father was a distinguished Welsh mathematician, a fellow of the Royal Society and a friend of Sir Isaac Newton, with relatives active in the Celtic revival. The boy entered Harrow Public School as on a scholarship as a child prodig prodigy at the age of seven and graduated from Oxford in 1763, having sailed through the Greek and Roman classics to Hebrew and Arabic in 1768. Jones accepted a prestigious commission from King Christian VII of Denmark to translate from the Persian into French, Aster Obadis Johan de Shoye Naderi, a life of the late Nader Shah. Jones despised this tyrant. Uh, and, uh, and gratuitously appended to, to his uh, translation, a treatise on Persian and Arabic poetry with 24 pages of odes by Hafiz rendered into elegant French. So already we know where he stands. Jones was something of a rebel, not alone among his peers in an England that sometimes distrusted its Celtic, nonconformist, or cosmopolitan fringes. Let us study the ancient Indians as we do the Greeks and the Romans, Jones urged his literate contemporaries. But some rated him too pompous and imaginative. And British liberals such as William Wilderforce and John Stuart Mill were also evangelical Christians with a knee-jerk bias against Indian paganism. Jones was planning a history of Turkey, and perhaps fortunately for Indo-Persian studies, failed to land the post of ambassador to Constantinople. However, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1772, and the next year, even more advantageously, to Dr. Johnson's prestigious Turks Head Club to enjoy coffee and conversation with such as Burke, Gibbon, and Goldsmith. Meanwhile, 
he had been studying law and was called to the bar in London in 1770. For light relief, he initiated a Druid circle and as chief Druid, as chief bard, entertained the company on the banks of the river uh, Kilgeron, Kilgeron Castle, uh, in, uh, uh, by Kilgeron Castle that is, in Cardigan, North Wales, with occasional verse anticipating Wordsworth, and a, an extempore piece, Kneel to the goddess whom all men adore, that is, uh, Diana, uh, Mary, Astarte, or Ganga. Not that he neglected Persian, publishing a series of verse translations and juxtaposing prose versions of odes by Hafiz and Horace. And in 1771, he wrote the first modern grammar of the language. In Calcutta, he was not an employee of the company. His boss was Warren Hastings, the first governor of the presidency of Fort William and head of the Council of Bengal, de facto governor general of India. More of a scholar than a saber rattling conqueror, over the next 10 years, Hastings supported Joan's academic pursuits, in particular the founding of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in Jones's second year. Here, in a famous lecture in 1786, Jones was to propose his theory of the relationship between Greek, Latin, Persian, and Sanskrit, which inaugurated the sciences of comparative Indo-European philology and historical linguistics. Members responded with a spate of, uh, of uh, serious Indo-Persian studies, such as Francis uh, Gladwin's translation of the Aine Akbari, the Institutes of Akbar on Mughal statecraft, and the classic work of Persian, uh, Persian Adab, Sadi's Gulistan. In Indology, Jones followed the lead of Dara Shakur, Shah Jahan's scholarly son, who with a team of pundits from Benares had commenced the translation of the Sanskrit Upanishads into Persian in 1867. Jones's continuation of this project was the first direct translation from the Sanskrit into a Western language. He also launched a veritable craze among the German romantics with his 1780 translation of Kalidasa's erotic drama Shakuntala. Not that he neglected his judicial duties. When not presiding on the bench, he pursued a project to record an exhausted digest of Hindu and Muslim law to legitimize British rule through the incorporation of native traditions. He also found time to pen helpful notes in favor of indigent Persian poets. He read and translated contemporary Persian Sufi poets, including exiles such as Hazim. And beyond all that, he ached for a chance to visit Iran, uh, where he had uh, established friendly contact with Mirza Hussein Farahani, the erudite and vizier. In spring of 1791, he wrote to his envoy in Shiraz, Hartford Jones Bridges, no relation to Jones, acknowledging receipt of a letter from Lutfali Khan Zand to be forwarded to Timur Shah Durrani in Kabul, evidently a plea for help against an imminent attack from uh, by Allah Muhammad Khan Qajar. He thanks Jones Bridges for sending him also a copy of Mirza Sadiq Nami's this, uh, definitive history of the Zand dynasty is one of my major sources for my dissertation and looks forward to visiting Shiraz within the, within the next two years. But this was not to be. The Durrani ruler died a year later. Shiraz fell to the Qajars. Lord Valley was betrayed and killed by Agha Muhammad in 1794, 
and Jones died in Calcutta on the 27th of April of the same year of a severe labor, uh, severe liver infection. He was buried in Calcutta in the Park Street Cemetery under an obelisk gravestone, mourned like Hazim by British, Indian and Persian alike. I have a short coda looking forward about a little known contemporary of Jones in Calcutta, though I don't know if they ever met. Army officers, uh, army officers and clan com company clerks needed to be taught the local contact language, assumed by the top brass to be Persian, the language of bureaucracy and high culture. John Berth Borthwick Christ Gilchrist, a Scottish surgeon with the company's Bengal army, became interested in the languages actually spoken in northern India, particularly the uh, Persianate, the Persianized vernacular of both Hindus and Muslims, later to be called Hindi and Urdu, which Gilchrist termed Hindustani. A tour of the region during 1785 uh, he's particularly Faisalabad near Lucknow, where Gilchrist sought out local poets, convinced him that this vernacular was a sophisticated medium with a literary register called Hendevi or Hindi. He reported that the pigeon variety called Moors, which in English soldiers and clerks were generally content to use, was inadequate for the purpose, and that Hindustani was more suitable than Persian the usual medium taught, often perfunctorily to more senior East India Company employees. Gilchrist was accepted to tutor, to tutor them in Persian and Hindustani, and from 1787 compiled the Hindustani grammar and a dictionary. In uh, 1801, he was engaged as the first professor of Hindustani at the newly established College of Fort William. Hiring munshis, native scribes, Gilchrist set them to translating stories from Persian into simple but elegant style of Hindustani to be printed in a modified Persian Arabic script. Some of these even became popular among Indian readers. The momentous, the momentous transitioning to Hindi Urdu as the medium of oral communication and popular literature had been recognized. So, I hail this otherwise obscure Edinburgh medic as a pioneer field sociologist avant la lettre with a notable policy impact. The East India Company did finally announce in 1824 and slowly implement its uh, reluctant switch to Urdu as the official language of administration. And it soon became clear to all that Persian's dolat, that is, its hallowed authority beyond its home in Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, was yielding to the age of national vernaculars. But that's another story. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Perry. Uh, I've been monitoring the uh, question in the chat and I think everyone just saw them mesmerized and um, uh, listening to three very packed uh, discussions. And I know from the chat that there is by popular demand, um, Mrs. Sudova, they all say that they really need more of your paper and it's so packed with information and it's absolute tour de force that they need to pour over it and can't wait for the publication. Um, looking at the questions, well, there's, there is a question addressed to um, Mrs. Sudar, but I'm just not quite sure what the period, it says, you know, in that period of time, why did Khorasan play such an important role? Now, I'm rather concerned that this might open the topic for another lengthy lecture, but maybe um, maybe Fatima John, you could ponder over that while I get to uh, slightly more to the point questions for Dr. Nijarati Sanjot John. 
uh, from Karim Javon first and then Omid uh, Mondegori. The first one is that perhaps you could merge the two. That do you consider the dispute over control of Herat as rivalry between two competing dynasties from the same culture or a bigger dispute between two different nations over an important cultural center? followed by a question on uh, the fact that you've used proto-nationalism for Iran. And why can't you just use nation state or nationalism for Iran as um, per Shahname and other evidences? So Sajid, would you like to address those? Thank you for uh, outlining those questions. Um, very interesting. And I suppose um, Karim has hit at the sort of heart of the issue of um, you know what constitutes the nation and uh, did um, did the Qajars and uh, Duranis belong to the same culture mm -hmm. um, or were they different nations? I th the way I would answer it is that the answer is a little bit complicated mm -hmm. and um, there are aspects of both different trends that would ring true. Um, there were aspects of culture that the Qajars and Duradis uh, certainly shared. Um, both were conversant in uh, Persian. Uh, they established Persianate uh, state structures. If you were to open up some of the tariqs or the chronicles written by the Qajars and the Duranis, uh, very similar language is being used and very similar ideas can be found in both. Um, both belong to a tribal background uh, the Qajar uh, Turkic tribes, and uh, we have the Durani Pashtun tribes. Mm -hmm. And so definitely there are instances of uh, overlap. Uh, however, there are very important differences that I tried to highlight in uh, the lecture. Uh, one was the fact that they belong to different uh, tribal backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, the Qajars are native uh, Turkic speakers, um, and they emphasized and uh, took pride in this uh, Turkic background. Uh, as indicated in various chronicles, which provide detailed uh, genealogies of the Qajars uh, back to um, even the Seljuk period, as uh, Fatima had mentioned. And uh, likewise, uh, the Afghans, the Duranis, developed their own sort of genealogical or tribal tradition that emphasized their Pashtun or uh, Afghan identity. And um, my argument that, uh, and I think there might be some disagreement, but my argument is that um, uh, Ahmed Shah and the Duranis were proud of their Pashtun background and um, they defined uh, the state um, in large part uh, by its Pashtun identity. So these are clear differences between yes. the Qajars and the Duranis. So yes, they, they are similar in some respects, but different in others. And uh, for Omid's question, it's a very good question as well. Why can't uh, the Qajars, and I think he's referring to the Qajars when he talks about Iran, uh, we're talking about the early Qajars. I think the answer would require us to delve into a little bit of theory of uh, uh, nationalism, what mm -hmm. constitutes nationalism. Um, there's definitely scholars out there that point to the Shahnama as containing sort of the kernel of uh, Persian or Iranian nationalism. Um, but then again, uh, the type of nationalism I was referring to, and I tried to provide a brief uh, definition, was the modern form of nationalism with its fixation, not just on common culture, but also this, um, you know, very clearly defined and demarcated borders. That's one of the defining features of modern nation states. And um, I would argue that's why the Russians and especially the British were so obsessed with clearly demarcating what these boundaries were so that they can establish these clear cut uh, uh, nation states. And I don't think that that was present yet uh, prior to the arrival of um, the colonial powers. Uh, it was maybe starting to develop, but it wasn't clearly well-defined as it would become in later periods. So that's one of the reasons why I would say that the have a sort of uh, uh, nation state uh, irrespective of the fact that the Shah Nama definitely was a uniting feature of the Iranians. Yes, that's it. Um, uh, so before I think, um, before um, moving on to the last paper, there's several questions for Professor Perry. Uh, there is a question from Abulala um, Sudab, I'm not sure whether addressed to Sajjad or to Fatima John, that it's about Azad Khan's relationship with Nader. Did this play any role in transmitting an empire building view for the Afghans? 
I'm not sure about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm afraid I don't. I, I'm, I don't know too much about Azad Khan, so I'm unable to answer. But um, he certainly had a. a uh, he, 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 I, I believe he was the one who castrated the Aga Muhammad Khan. Yes. So he left a very lasting mark on Aga Muhammad Khan's character and behavior. Yes, absolutely. Do you, Sajjad, do you have anything to add to that question? Well, I think uh, if anyone should speak on this, it's probably uh, Dr. Perry. He's uh, okay. a specialist on um, the situation in the Western half of Iran for mm -hmm. sure. And, uh, has written extensively about Azad Khan. Yeah. Um, my only, the only point I would like to bring up is um, based on my preliminary research, and this is one of the topics that I really wanted to discuss with Professor uh, Perry was uh, the identity of Azad Khan, was he actually an Afghan? And uh, based on my research, although the, some of the sources do attribute him an Afghan uh, identity, I believe this is because many of the Qalze Afghans that were in his army, um, they were stationed in Western Afghanistan and formed an important part of his military. Yes. He himself, I'm not sure if he was actually, uh, if he actually identified as Afghan himself. But uh, that's uh, a topic, I guess, for another day. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, if I now move the conversation to um, uh, Sir William Jones, several questions around that. I had one as well, Professor Perry. I don't know whether. Um, any conversation uh, in any of the writings of William Jones, whether he ever uh, refers to Filippo Sassetti, I think the merchant in the 16th century who really first came across the idea of Sanskrit being so close to, I mean, he saw so many parallels with Italian that uh, it sort of put it, and I think he coined the name Sanskrit, but that perhaps was something to refer to later. Several questions from Dr. Takin about um, uh, uh, William Jones, that um, considering that East India Company took up Urdu in place of Persian, so how was it that Persian continued to thrive and remain popular in India? Um, and you know, so much so that Dr. Tacking says that in his student days in 1960s, you know, this was still people could still um, lucidly uh, declaim Persian poetry. And another similar question is that, um, uh, oh, another one is that, do you think that his Welsh background played any role in shaping his linguistics interests? And um, uh, uh, was he? By any chance, influ influenced uh, through, you know, uh, in view of his linguistic discoveries by Khana Arezu. Um, and I think just perhaps maybe I'll pause over there to give you a chance to mull over these. Hmm. Quite a barrage. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a uh, university. Just, just, just to start with, with Azad Khan Atagan in uh, Karim Khan's time. It's interesting that he may not have been ethnically an Afghan, uh, but certainly he was always known as uh, Azad Khan Afghan and uh, excoriated as an Afghan enemy by the, uh, the Western Iranians, by um, Karim Khan and people. So um, it's, uh, it's all part of this, uh, this um, ethnic... Um, what should we call? What do we call it these days? Ethnic um, mm. marking, whatever. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, of the time. Yes. And okay. it's certainly significant for the uh, subsequent relationship. And yes. uh, Herat, likewise, is um, on the border now. That's uh, really the. Uh, the Afghans still consider it part of Afghanistan, and the Iranians, of course, have claimed it for themselves, and it's, uh, it's yeah. up for grabs. <laughs> yes, yeah. And what do you, uh, so you, you um, in terms of longevity of uh, popularity of Persian, uh, particularly literature, yeah. to, to the you know, uh, true, 1950s and 60s, over yeah. Urdu? It's true. The Indians are Indians are in some ways um, 
behind the times, thank goodness, in relation mm -hmm. to uh, culture and language. And like, the, uh, like some of the people in Jones's period, they were so well acquainted with so-called classical languages that they had reams of poetry and prose and ideas by heart in Latin and Greek and in, uh, respectively in Persian. Mm -hmm. So you do find people who can quite happily quote and function in uh, literary Persian. But the, the sticking point strictly in um, linguistic uh, studies is that um, it is no longer, Persian is no longer a living language in India. It's not used by a majority or a considerable uh, plurality of the population as their first language. It's the major cultural language still. I have an old friend, for example, in um, a typical example of this kind of culture, uh, who is originally from uh, Pakistan, mm -hmm. a friend of mine from Cambridge. He is in um, uh, civil engineering, professor of civil engineering, but he is now fluent and happy in Turkish, as uh, well as presumably still in Urdu. And he has a great store of Persian literature and lore, and is quite happily uh, also um, still writing uh, historical um, articles on um, Turkish and Persian and Turco Persian literary figures. So uh, it's uh, to that extent, Indian, uh, India is, is certainly part of the Persianate. Uh, cosmopol cosmopolis, yes. but um, not not a place where a Persian is still a um, uh, a spoken language, as it is in Iran, where it's only just the, sp the major spoken language for that matter. There's a whole lot of Turkish natively spoken yes. of various kinds in Iran, as we know. So it's a very complicated matter. Absolutely. And of course, you know, the role of national curriculum or, you know, when of course superseded yes. by English. And I think in Iran, possibly, you know, following the French model of having an absolute set national curriculum, whether you're in an elitist school or in a tent school in a rural place, Farsi is the language of teaching and broadcast, exactly. but un undeniable yes. that that part of the world you know, people are, you know, incredibly multilingual, never mind mother tongue, but local languages of communication and goes, one cannot deny that Turkish, one can deny it out of fear of nationalists that right. would dare to say how prevalent use of various, uh, this, you know, registers of Turkish are, but without a doubt. And um, for your interest, Professor Perry, uh, fellow uh, panelists from an earlier session, uh, Janet uh, tells us that you might be interested to know that the divan of Mir Kamaruddin Menat at the British Library, with a reference given, contains portraits of William Jones, Warren Hastings, and Richard Johnson, and Qasida owed to Jones in praise of his knowledge and to Hastings of his enlightened vision. Oh, oh, so yeah. <laughs> we'll have to have that scanned and um, sent uh, to you. Um, there is also a heads up for Mrs. Sudovar from Simon Rose about um, relating to a much earlier period of history of Persia and its role as a sea trading hub with the Indian subcontinent. There is to be an experimental archaeological expedition in the area of South Iran by sea demonstrating the trade route subject as always to permits being uh, granted. And um, I I think I had, I think I saw another question for uh, Sajjad. Can I ask about that, that uh, expedition? When is that you? And yes, please, I, could you, Simon Rose, could you kindly give further detail? Could you please, or perhaps you could separately. You can just send me an yeah, email about e exactly, it. Exactly, perhaps a little bit of the 
um, subject now. And um, uh, I, there was another question for, um, uh, I think, did I, I hope, uh, Sajjad, forgive me if I've already read this out. I don't think I have, Dr. Nejati. How do the Durrani campaigns to Mashhad reinstalling Shah Rukh Afshar as a sort of client and subsequent battles with Muhammad Hassan Khan Qajar fit into your story? Do you see proto-national claims or implications at the early date in the 1750s? Uh, it's a very interesting question, 1750s. Um, I'm afraid uh, I don't, I haven't read too much about any proto-nationalist sort of uh, implications uh, regarding yeah. installing Shahrukh as, uh, as a client in Mashhad. Uh, one of the reasons may be because uh, this chronicle of Ahmed Shah's reign was uh, commissioned uh, in the year 1754. Yeah. Uh, which was um, the year uh, that uh, the Durans uh, captured Mashhad. And uh, the chronicler Mahmoud uh, Husseini was actually a native of Mashhad, but um, uh, it seems like he had a sort of soft spot for Shah yeah. So very uncritical, not too many details about uh, Shah Rukh himself. Um, and uh, because uh, the Afshadids of Mashhad were clients of the Durani's, um, they weren't really adversaries and uh, they were more satellites as I think Kevin mentioned. So um, not so much details in the sources about any uh, sort of proto-nationalist uh, uh, sentiments yeah. uh, surrounding Mashhad and uh, the yeah. Afsharids there. Fantastic, very good. And I think another question from Kevin Gledhill, again, I don't think I read this earlier, someone claiming to be Azad Khan or perhaps his son appeared among the Goklen, I'm not sure I pronounced it right, in the 1780s and is attested by the Russian sources trying to mobilize against Aga Muhammad Khan. Perhaps whether it's a comment or just... Um, all kinds of people going to yeah. the Goklen. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. All kinds of petty claimants. Yes, yeah. Yes, no, that, that is um, uh, fantastic. Um, and I think that uh, uh, seems to have, if there are any further questions, I'm not sure, Aki John, whether there are any questions on the Facebook stream uh, that um, you might like to share with us. Um, uh, but otherwise, I, uh, it, it's perhaps time to, I don't know if the panelists now, would you like to, the three of you after this, Q&A session, are there any other points you'd like to add? I don't know, Professor Perry is... Uh, I don't see any other questions. No, there are no questions there, yes. Um, and Fatima John, Shoma? I, I, I would like to give one or two examples of how um, misguided nationalism can mm -hmm. actually distort culture traveling from um, Khiva to the old capital, Urganj, of the, the old capital of the Khara, mm -hmm. is beautiful, and which has since um, gone out of bounds. People are not allowed to visit. It's beautiful. Yes. Uh, I saw a sign saying, Is mm -hmm. I tried to figure out what Is Mukhshir could possibly be. I asked the Turkmen guys. They had mm -hmm. no idea. Uh, finally, it occurred to me that it was Zamakhshar. It was the birthplace of Zamakhshari, the great philologist of Quranic, Arabic, and also Persian. And uh, so I suggested it, but nobody had ever heard about Zamakhshari. So you yeah. get a lot of distorted information like this mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they cut off um, yeah. the connection with, with their previous heritage. And, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the restoration of Sultan Sanjar's tomb. Robert Hillenbrand has a whole list of yes. other examples where, I mean, uh, on my recent trip to Samarkand last year, uh, they are um, changing so many things that they're actually um, changing the face of their own immediate history. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think these, these, these distortions need to be exposed yes, yes. to keep the historical truths alive. 
Yes, yeah. Um, for TV John, while I have you online, there's a question just come in for you that could you please explain whether at the time of your paper, art was used only for and by the elites? Where, sorry, I... The, uh, the art in the period was used only for and by the elites. Um, the art? Yes, artistic production, I, I imagine. Yes, it's a rather um, open... Uh, and well, yes and no. Of course, it was always the elite who had to patron, uh, to be the patrons of the art and, and finance it and so on. I mean, no one more so than Koharshad in Herat and yes. so on. But, but you had the guilds who tra transmitted the, the, the crafts and they, that's why they stayed alive from one dynasty to the other. Yeah, team with art to cover architecture to cover from Seljuk architecture mm. and so on, you know, and 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 Safavid from from Timuri, because you had these guilds who preserved the secrets of the crafts, yeah. and, and and that 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 was one of the um, secrets of um, of the survival of Persian mm. architecture until the modern era when it has gone haywire with with. Uh, tile panels ordered in China, uh, well, you know, industrial production of love tile panels and... Yes, yeah. Can I jump in here briefly? Please, please yeah, do, we'll yes. A couple of things, just not to sell, uh, not to sell short uh, Indo-Persian. Um, I've just been reminded that um, the Mushaira um, tradition is still alive and well in, in India. Everybody, they they uh, they get together and recite Persian poetry, mm -hmm. and uh, esp especially also poems newly uh, created, newly um, for, newly um, written in in Persian. And um, uh, what's the other thing? Yeah, the. The question of language is, is 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 very is crucial to all these things, of course, but in very different ways. And going back to actually some something that um, Sajjad mentioned, I think um, the um, in Britain in uh, or you actually talking about Jones and his his being Welsh. The um, British in right up into the nineteenth century. Uh, actively forbade the Irish to speak their own language, okay, yeah. in fact. And the Iranians, up to very recent times, were uh, st uh, trying to stop the Azerbaijanis from, from publishing Azerbaijani literature, banning imports of that sort of thing. So Today, things are, for the moment anyway, just a little more uh, sensible, but God knows. I mean, yeah, recently yeah. we've come across um, horrible examples of a uh, return to um, sort of primitive um, biases as uh, political lo uh, low stones, lodestones mm. once again. Yes, yeah. So, uh, but... Um, Yes, I know that in, uh, you know from colleagues or people I've worked with in uh, Uzbekistan, it's not very easy to you yeah. know, try to even publish books in Persian, or Persian let, let alone have the literary um, circles that they would have. Language uh, and identity mm -hmm. are so intimately linked that uh, it's to all the, the yes. very, very tricky dealing with that. Absolutely, absolutely. I have to say that when I, I say, yes, but please uh, do find the Virginia. Uh, the reasons are very different. In some cases, uh, the intention is to create a new identity from scratch, yes. old identity. In other cases, it's because an old identity is being destroyed for political reasons from outside. So it, it, uh, its um, uh, strength is being undermined within because, because it can serve as a vehicle for, for attacks from our, by, by uh, hostile enemies and so on. So you have a, a diversity of reasons for the uh, distortion of cultural um, integrity. Yes, yeah. 
Um, absolutely. I um, perhaps I'll finish with uh, one couple of questions. Every time I say I'll finish with this question, another one pops up. But first of all, one from um, Abu Lala Sudovar. How did and perhaps uh, panelists, if you would keep it brief, how did the Durani's view? Uh, Azad Khan. Did they feel that they owed anything to him? Um, I think I'll take up uh, the yes, question. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, please. Yeah, uh, I honestly, this is one of the reasons why I'm uh, questioning uh, the identity of Azad Khan. There's no information on him in any of the Afghan sources. Mm -hmm. And uh, they usually provide at least some details about uh, mm -hmm. some of these prominent figures. Um, and yeah, I, I do believe that again, that uh, identification as Afghan most likely is uh, due to uh, the large number of Afghans in Azad Khan's army. Mm. And so, because they became associated with their leader, he uh, by extension would have taken on that identity to some extent. But again, this is just a working theory, but yeah, to answer Abu Lala's uh, question, I haven't found any details in the on, on that thing. Yeah. On that, it does not have some Caucasian connection. Yes, I think so. I, I think I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think there must be some connection to uh, Georgia, which mm -hmm. uh, I believe you married the married Georgian princess. Exactly. Exactly. So that's my sort of working theory. Georgia that I might have had a Georgia background. I have many others, of course, but. Uh, well, yeah, just, uh, the like to go all the way to Tiflis and marry a Georgian princess. Mm. But I think, and Professor Perry, would you like to have the yeah, last yeah, word on this issue? Something important I have to add that is, um, as well as uh, thanking the organizers and, pre and presenters for this marvelous uh, occasion, I, I do want to acknowledge my uh, wife, Ranjana, mm -hmm. and daughter, Tara. The technical help in the zooming of this rather yeah. well, difficult uh, yeah. oh. activity. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful you. family effort. In the, yeah. for that. Well, thank you very much. I think we're on very good time to, before I invite Professor Charles Melville back to wrap up uh, the today's uh, proceedings. So I am really grateful to. Uh, Mrs. Fatim Vesud of our Farman Farmanyan to Dr. Sajjad Nejati and to Professor John Perry. And I'd love to, for Professor Perry, I went to, when I was working on the grammar, I went to look at our special collections at the SARS Library where you have to put in a request uh, to look at uh, a copy of William Jones's grammar. And I have to say, it was pretty good. It may be, you know, but maybe not as formidable as uh, perhaps softer around the edges compared to Professor Anne Lampton's, but mm -hmm. I was mega impressed with his uh, attention to detail. It's anyway, some of the stuff written since. Is, yes, yes, really, <laughs> but I mean, it's really, he, he, he knew his stuff. Yeah. Uh, and thank you very much indeed. And before I sign off, I uh, also would like to thank all our participants who are staying the course with us. And I'll hand over to Professor Melville. Yes, well, thank you very much. It's interesting, of course, that uh, Jones did his grammar without ever going to Iran uh, and before he even went to India. I mean, this is quite remarkable. And it, it is the case, of course, that pretty well every English grammar of Persian for the next hundred years was written by people in India. Uh, and most of them had never been to Iran either. And uh, <laughs> I was writing a brief article about this that never got published. But some of the examples of um, stock conversations you could have uh, were really incredibly amusing. Uh, they're all written in this sort of uh, Indian mentality about what you say to your servants about how long your boiled eggs should be boiled and stuff like that. But the whole, a whole raft of one English grammar after another was written by um, British Indian officials who'd never been anywhere near Iran. Anyway, I listened to the last panel as to the other three, just quietly in the background, of course. And the first thing is to thank this recent panel, but all, all our nine speakers for a day that I think has hung together extremely well, and in which we've started um, with Russia and the encroachments and the um, cultural interactions um, with the great neighbor to the north on the one side, and we've uh, gone through um, also 
uh, in the last panel, uh, Iran's interactions with um, Central Asian entities and then uh, down into India. So we've, we've seen really um, Iran talking about moving into a new world order. We have explored all the boundaries that really begin to form uh, a sort of um, at least Iran's um, physical and geographical boundaries. Of course, they're just taking place now, beginning to shape up in the period we've been talking about. Um, one of the sort of stock uh, appreciations of the uh, 18th century, of course, is um, uh, the, uh, the notion that after the Safavids, Iran sort of plunged back into this tribal chaos uh, and then emerged out of it in the early 19th century with the establishment of the Qajar dynasty. And of course, in some sense, that's more or less true. But I think what we've seen actually is a classic example of a long term phenomenon in Iranian history of um, the alternation between uh, strong, more or less centralized rule and then fragmentation. And that doesn't necessarily mean that um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the continuities uh, uh, aren't there throughout these periods of fragmentation. And one only has to think of the Safarids actually who were mentioned much earlier on in the day. Um, well, maybe only actually by Sajjad, I think as, as um, you know, carrying the flag of Persian culture and the sense of Iranianness, even through the ninth century, where of course Iran as a country had more or less ceased to exist in theory. So um, I, th I think what we've seen is partly an ex exploration of this phenomenon in the um, case of the uh, late 18th and early 19th century. And also the, um, the, uh, so the, the extraordinary interest of what, what was going on in this period, which appears to be so chaotic from the outside in terms of uh, artistic continuities and changes. Uh, and of course, it's a bit of a cliche, but continuity and change is um, very much a sense of what, what one has. And um, this is really just a slice of history. I mean, I think Fatima's talk took us through a great long uh, sort of look back of really the whole situation regarding um, Iran's interaction with Turan, essentially. I mean, this is what it is, and this has gone on for centuries. Sajjad was talking about the long interaction, of course, with Eastern Greater Khorasan and who it belongs to. I mean, the fact is these are very long dure uh, issues, and the, the question of language and Shahnameh and identity is, all comes into the mix uh, time and again through all these long periods. So, um, I, I personally think we've had a, a very stimulating day and all the panelists have delivered what they were expected to deliver and promised to deliver uh, and given us um, a, a good treat. Um, I'd like to say that um, not, unfortunately the question and answer sessions have not been preserved. I mean, the chat is preserved, although the chat is largely among us and probably should be deleted, but <laughs> the... Um, the uh, Q&A session, uh, unfortunately, is not there. So, and of course, we haven't been able to answer every single question. So if anybody had a question that hasn't been answered, I, I'd recommend they get in touch, with, in touch with the individual speaker concerned. Um, I don't think after a rather a long day, we need to hear an awful lot more about me, but um, I'd just like to remind our speakers that um, in due course, I'll be asking for your papers to be presented to me in written up form for publication. Uh, you'll probably have quite a nice long time to do this because depending on uh, what um, the Sudava Foundation decides and uh, everybody's energy, the chances are we'll have a second Kajar period uh, to follow this one. And it may be, as in the case of the Safavid, uh, two Safavid um, conferences. We merge both conferences into one volume. I have to say that for me as editor, this is actually jolly hard work. So we may decide to just do this volume as a standalone volume, which I think actually works rather well. 
uh, and then do a later Kajar one uh, for a second volume, because in the case of the Safavids, of course, it's a much longer period, and it was so many bits from one end and another, and one subject from another, that it seems sensible to wait till they were all together. But anyway, um, so we'll have to let you know about that. And um, the uh, series is beautifully well established now, and um, we're looking forward to a continuation of it. Um, uh, just see if I had any other comments to make. Uh, I think really uh, I've said everything I wanted to say, uh, except perhaps just a, a coda on uh, the question of India, because apart from the grammarians, and uh, John Pay referred to the lexicographers, I mean, we've also got to bear in mind that there are probably as many Persian manuscripts in India as there are in Iran, and these are I wouldn't say neglected, but they're increasingly neglected now. And anybody who's been to India and looked at the collections of um, Persian manuscripts sees they're in a very poor condition and that the resources available for looking after them are very much reduced. I think this reflects partly on this question of nationalism, because at the moment, um, the Persian heritage is not a top priority in India. So um, I would encourage everybody interested in this phenomenon of the spread of Persian outside the immediate borders of modern Iran to remember to try to look at and consult and ideally save the incredibly rich and important collections, which of course are also an interesting reflection of how Persian culture traveled and what, was it, what texts were thought to be interesting uh, and to be preserved. And of course, we all know that Saudi's Gulistan was probably um, one of the most, and it was even used for the uh, Indian uh, civil service exams for uh, tens of years. This was one of the set texts, uh, Platz's edition and translation of which I have to say I have a copy, uh, was a set text for the British Raj for many years. Um, so there's a huge overlap, of course, with India, which is, um, I'm very glad that we were able to get this in at the end. So without more ado, I think it's really just to um, reiterate our thanks to our panelists and to Aki at the background who sat through the whole day looking after us and making sure everything was working. I'd like to thank very warmly my co-convener Sarah for all her efforts in making sure that this did actually happen this year and everybody for participating, participating uh, so um, fully and enthusiastically in, in our day. Uh, and just a final word Fatima, thank you very much. You're looking great. I'm very glad you could uh, join us. So I think that's all from me. So I'm going to be quiet now and um, I, I shall leave the meeting and uh, hope to see you all again in real life before too long. Thank you. Wonderful. There, yes, there, if, uh, there's a question about the contact details. So please, anyone who wishes to, you could either send it to, so as, um, uh, you know, you'll find Sarah um, on the uh, on SOAS website, so perhaps might be easier um, to forward any queries you have to that, and then we'll be able to forward them to the speakers. That might be easier. Although most of the speakers' uh, emails are on the institution's pages, so I just thought I'll read out that last uh, request. Just thank you, uh, Nargis. Thank no, you. Just thank you so future. much. Such a lovely way of spending Saturdays. And I put my fairy lights out for you as well. May the rest of your Saturday be scintillating. <laughs> <laughs>